replacing you in the period. Some of the insights and understandings about human interaction that are so important in our books come from our own life experiences, things we've seen, people that we've known. They really focus a lot in our minor characters as we're trying to create a sketch of who this person is in each book. We started out in both cases with an initial concept for what and Rutledge were going to be like, but that has developed over time. Don't have to read either series in order, but those people who do, do notice certain nuances and changes in the characters because obviously they've lived through the experience of the previous book. Oh, that is very true. Will Bess ever cross over into Ian's books or will Ian <laughs> cross over into Bess's books? Just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, Bess's stories run about two years behind Rutledge. Ah. And so it's sort of hard to include them in a book. We never really developed Bess as future wife for Rutledge. We wanted to show what women went through in the Great War. And we wanted her to be the kind of person she is, eager to help a nurse, well-trained in her profession, accustomed to the Army because her father was a colonel. She was sort of an Army brat in a way. So these things developed her. And although in one book we had a character contact Beth in Paris for an answer that Rutledge needed, we could be sure she was in Paris at that time, but we can't be sure where she's going to be in 1920. 21, where she is back in 1919. As you know, Beth and Ian cross bloodline, so to speak. Uh, Melinda Crawford is a close family friend of Rutledge's parents. Through that, there's some minor crossover. Beth uh, is her cousin. Yeah, but as far as would they meet somewhere, the problem is, is let's say we have Bess come into this next mystery. What are we going to do when two years from now, in Bess's lifetime, the mystery that she's involved in has already been written? That would be but a logistic so, nightmare. <laughs> they know each other, aware of each other. They've met in the years prior to the Great War. It's not as if they are complete strangers, but I think it's best to keep the two series separate. I think it works better for the reader. And there are some people who just love Beth, others who just love Ian, and then there are those who love both of the books. Me, so we me, <laughs> me too. Speaking of Beth, Beth and Simon seem to have a connection. Will this bloom into a relationship in the series? Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, our characters talk. Beth hasn't said anything about Simon yet, and Simon hasn't said anything about Beth. They've been close all her life, and I think she has to gradually become aware of him rather than just waking up one day and saying, oh my goodness, the war has finally ended. If she had had a relationship during the war, she would have had to leave the nursing service. They were very careful about nurses fraternizing with wounded. She has fulfilled her duty, and now as we progress in the series, she's going to have to make some life changes, and we're really curious to know what they're going to be. Thank you. As we find out, we'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just find that fascinating. We hear that over and over again about how the characters dictate what happens to them in a story, and I just find that so interesting. If you set out how your characters are going to be, they're puppets, and they do what you tell. But if you let them go and live as they would have lived at the time, quite often they'll surprise you with directions that you hadn't expected. And that's why we don't plot the books ahead of time. We sort of follow the characters around and say, ooh, this is interesting. Let's see where this goes. Charles particularly likes that. The only problem is when you get to 80 or 90,000 words and you still haven't figured out who did it. <laughs> they didn't tell you that, huh? <laughs> it's really interesting to let the story dictate it. My husband, who was our proofreader, kept saying, I don't know where you're going with this. And we didn't either. We didn't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Charles, I have to tell you, we met Carolyn last week at Malice Domestic. The moderator asked the panelists to paint a picture of their protagonists. And your mother channeled Ian and Bess so convincingly. It was really a riveting performance, truly. It was all inspiring I sat there with my mouth hanging open. <laughs> <laughs> 
I didn't know beforehand that she was going to ask us to do it in the first person. I thought she was just going to ask us to describe our characters. And then when she said the first person, I thought, oh, what am I going to say? And it just started from what we know about the book. I'm going to have to listen to that tape and find out what I said. (laughs) (laughs) They said that you can find the video recording, and we're definitely going to look for that. To our listening audience, if you have ever have a chance, pull that up because it was wonderful. If you do find it, please email it to us. Oh, yes, definitely. Where we can find it. (laughs) The link, you wanted to know about what's coming up next? That's what we were going to lead into. <laughs> uh, talking about the event. So, do you uh, have any new books or events? We have uh, Cruel Deception is the next batch. It will be out on the 17th of September. Sun has our beautiful cover already posted. It's available for pre order now. Then, Rutledge will be back in late January, early February with a divided loyalty. Ooh, sounds so we're good. We're on the cover for that now. We're still working <laughs> and looking forward. We always go to England every year and looking forward to our next trip. We're going to Stratford on Avon and we're going to see As You Like It in the Globe Theater. And, wow. And uh, we the got things you get to do. <laughs> voucher cons coming up in Dallas in the fall and all the usual wonderful conferences that we get to go to. We like these conferences because we get to meet people like you and other readers. It's nice to, to talk to people who read the books and not a reviewer whose job it is to review it, but somebody who's read it and can tell you, yeah, I liked it and I like this character. And you think, well, okay, that character worked in this class book. That's great. So it's really a wonderful thing to go to these conferences. Between that and social media and email, it means a great deal to hear from fans because when you work real hard on this particular book and you hit send, <laughs> you know, deep down inside, you get all your fingers crossed. It's nice to hear what, as Caroline said, the, the readers think about it, and it gives you some understanding of what clicked. A lot of times what gets us is there's something will stand out to someone from a book that we hadn't really expected. You know, sometimes you want something specifically to stand out in a book, but sometimes readers will come up to you and say, you know, I was really struck by that golden retriever. And, you know, <laughs> wow, okay, yeah, I remember that golden retriever. <laughs> you know, that was interesting. That's what's always so fascinating. I have always said, and I I think Caroline will agree with me that writing books is like movies in the mind. You see the little movie in your mind, you try and put it on paper as best you can. And then if you do a good job, when you're reading a book, stop looking at the words, and you're not really aware that you're turning the pages anymore. You've got that little movie going in your mind. It's interesting to see how the two movies match up sometimes. One of the questions we're often asked when we are at a panel or in an interview is, who would play Rutledge or Beth if ever we decided to let either series be produced for Masterpiece or HBO or whatever? We've been careful so far because we didn't want the characters taken and changed. But this is a question that comes up. So I'll ask you, hmm. who do you think would play Rutledge? Oh, well, that is, oh, you're putting us on the good spot. good question. Yeah, I'm horrible with actors' names. <laughs> well, I would the... want somebody who was George Clooney age-wise, but he couldn't be quite as good-looking as George Clooney. What's that one actor's name, that, that, so... that, that Australian guy? What's that, that guy's name? Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. He yep. would be good, yes. Rutledge is actually about 30 years old. Yeah, you mentioned that in the panel. See, I picture him a little older, about 40-ish. I was surprised that he was so young because it's really not clear in the books. It makes sense, too, though, mm-hmm. thinking about... He says come out of the war. Right. Yes. So well, then a young Hugh one. Jackman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll drink to that. Uh-huh. <laughs> about a month apart because we were concerned, and if we hadn't kept them a month apart, it would be in 1965 and Rutledge would be 90, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be running into World War II. Yeah. yeah. I picture Bess like an Amy Adams, a redhead, young and sprightly and on the go. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So I kind of picture a, like a Natalie Portman. 
Yes, now she's a good actress. Yes. yes. So I'm curious, now that we've answered yours, who do you usually say? Oh, that's it. I keep changing. <laughs> I see him in my head, but I don't, he's his own yeah. person to me. Because I've lived with him now for 20 years. Yeah. And so I don't see him hard to put in his shoes. The two best that once again show how you would never pick persons who did it well. When David Suchet did her Kill Poirot, yes. I thought that was outstanding. I'd seen David Suchet and other things. I would not have picked him for that. And in Sherlock Holmes, I never would have picked Jeremy Brett to be Sherlock Holmes. And yet, in my opinion, he was the, the best. best one there is no other. Yes, <laughs> he is wonderful in that part. That's what makes it so hard sometimes for us to say, well, you know, this person, I guess a lot of it has to do with the way that the actor interprets the role. I wouldn't want him to be an extremely short American. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Now, I was just going to ask you if you had any other questions. Um, you have us here. A quick question, because we didn't ask. How did you two decide to start collaborating as novelists? That was so odd. I'd always wanted to be a writer, and I don't think Charles had ever really thought about it. But we were both history buffs. We both liked stopping at signs along the road that say, two miles from here is where so-and-so lived or where this battle was fought. I was visiting in North Carolina where Charles was working at that time. My husband and I were down there for vacation, and we went to Kings Mountain, which is a Revolutionary War battlefield right on the north and south Carolina border. And it's sort of a flat-top mountain, sort of like a mesa out west. And a big battle was fought there. It led to Guilford Courthouse and from Guilford Courthouse to Yorktown and the end of the war. So it was a major conflict. And we knew enough about it that we were walking around saying, oh, this is where this went this and we remember that there was a man who was found dead there who had no reason to be there. He should have been 200, 300 miles away in the eastern shore of North Carolina. So why was he there? Which side killed him? I mean, he died up there on the hill. It could have been either one. He could have gotten a caught a stray bullet or whatever. So we were talking about this going home. And I said something to Charles about the fact that much as we love history and mystery, we ought to combine the two and write a book about it. And Charles was not the most enthusiastic person. <laughs> uh, so I let the subject drop. And then later on, Charles, you want to pick up the thought? My job had changed. I was working as an operations analyst for a corporation. And I had time in the hotels where I was staying in the evening time. And fortunately, they, you wouldn't recognize it today, but the laptops and phone modems where you could dial into the Internet and so I had some time on my hands, and I contacted Caroline. I asked her if she was serious, and she said, yeah. And so we hunted away at first, through trial and error, until we found method that worked for both of us. That's a funny thing. I've been on lots of panels, and I've run symposiums with co-authors. I've never met any two co-authors that do it the same way. That's right. Each one has their own way of doing things, and we figured out a way that worked well for us. And we were fortunate enough to get published. And the thing that still amazes me was in 1996, when Tessa Wills came out, as Caroline said, nobody was writing about World War One. There was no Downton Abbey or English Patient or anything like that out there. As far as PTSD is concerned, 9-11 was quite a ways away. Shell shock or post-traumatic stress disorder was not a current topic like it is today. And so it came as a real surprise to us when it got all the attention it did and the nominations it received and everything. It was just mind-boggling. Well, we're very grateful that you guys did because you have given us many hours of entertainment. Did you ever write the story of the Civil War mystery? <laughs> we thought so, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, okay. <laughs> oh, because that sounded very interesting. Yeah. yeah, we'd read that one. <laughs> we'll read anything you write. <laughs> oh, that's lovely to hear. Yeah, put out your grocery uh, list. <laughs> the problem is time more than anything else. When you're doing a full menu, script every six months plus traveling plus doing research and doing some short stories and things it really is a full-time job yeah it must be 
We yeah. keep thinking of, oh, wouldn't it be nice to write a book about so and so? But uh, <laughs> we'd have to do it in our sleep. We couldn't. <laughs> uh, we did the standalone, which was called 